May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The one who gave birth to Jesus was the first true prophet of our Christian faith. As a teenage girl from the village of Nazareth, Mary received and proclaimed the coming of God to save the world. Long before John was baptizing and crying in the wilderness, and long before her son Jesus was prophesying deliverance to the people of Palestine, Mary was singing. Mary was praising God, saying to Elizabeth and the angels and anyone who could hear in her sixth month of pregnancy, there is an awesome power of God. And she said this, God's mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before God. God shows strength and scatters the bluffing braggarts. God knocks tyrants off their high horses, pulls victims out of the mud, brings the starving poor to the banquet, and sends the callous rich out into the cold. These were her words as she traveled on a donkey over mountainous terrain over 90 miles in the last stages of her pregnancy because the tyrants of her time demanded this to happen, Mary made it to the city of David just in time to deliver salvation into the world. The circumstances of delivering salvation were challenging enough. This was no ordinary birth. This was no ordinary Messiah. The Jews were suffering under the brutality of Roman occupation. They needed and they expected a valiant warrior, somebody who would arrive on horseback, come into the crowd, breaking the chains of oppression with the sweeping of a sword. What they got instead was a baby, a vulnerable baby, born in the straw of a drafty stable. Although she felt the power and presence of God, Mary must have had some doubts that night about the wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace, who he really was, and who was it that she was holding in her arms. After all, she had birthed the Son of God in a stable. She had laid him in a feed trough, which is usually used by the animals and had been used just before his birth. There's nothing safe or sanitary about this delivery. Was his welcoming party supposed to be what it was, some scruffy, smelly shepherds who had just run out of the fields leaving their flock in the middle of the night? That should have been a red flag or two right there. Or what about the strange visitors from the east who brought really inappropriate gifts for a baby? Didn't they know anything about babies and what mothers really needed when babies are born? Mary pondered all these things in her heart. She must have trembled in fear and in pain as she gave birth that night so long ago, attended only by her new husband in a cold stable in a strange town. Days later, she must have been gripped by terror and fear as she fled for her life, for her baby's life, to a strange land called Egypt. A new mother, an exile, a wanted woman whose son had a price on his head? And what kind of anguish must have seared through her soul when she discovered that the birth of her son caused the death of all the other newborn sons in the house of David? This birth story is surrounded by terror and by death stories. There is trauma associated with Jesus' birth, as well as joy and delight. There were challenging days and nights, and through those days and nights, she raised him in Egypt. And when it was safe, under the cover of darkness practically, they returned to their hometown of Nazareth, and there she watched him grow in wisdom and strength. But when he stayed behind in the temple and they lost track of him when he was 12, she must have been terrified and frightened that he had been abducted and slain. After all, his picture was still up in the post office. This kid was wanted by all of the palace police and the Romans. 
at the wedding in Cana, this proud mother called on her son to turn water into wine, and he rebuked her in front of family and friends and neighbors as he reluctantly performed a miracle. While he, and when he headed out of the carpenter's workshop to teach and to heal, to live out his messianic calling, Mary must have known that this was the beginning of the end. She was a poor Jewish woman, a victim of oppression of class and race and gender. You could not get much lower than a woman in a patriarchal society in first century Palestine under the boot of Roman occupation as a Jew and a peasant in a land with those who had money. But Mary was not like any other woman. Mary was chosen by God to be a vessel of God's incarnation. God's promise had already become truth in her flesh, and she was an undaunted prophet. Mary wove her story into a faith history, and it grew out of a faith history. Her name itself translated from Miriam, which means rebellion. In the spirit of Miriam, Mary drew strength from her ancient sister's powerful leadership of liberation. And with her strength, Mary stood by Jesus to the very end. She was faithful to him, to him until his dying day, until his last breath. She never abandoned him from cradle to cross. Although her soul was pierced to the core and at times she did not understand him, she loved him with all the fervor of a mother's love. God chose well when God chose Mary to be the mother of our Savior. She was our prophet. She opened the door to each of our hearts. Tonight, I wanted to tell you about Mary because as we kneel at the manger tonight, it is her heart which brings the world to us tonight. And with her, all of the mothers and the millions of the millions of those who have died worldwide from COVID are in her heart and should be on our hearts. And all of the mothers of the children in cages at the border in our nation should be in our hearts. And all of the millions of mothers who are holding their babies, who are starving and in need of food and just seeking a chance to see them grow out of infancy to childhood to adulthood should be in our hearts tonight. And all of the mothers of refugees whose children lie at their feet or in arms and are not able to speak the language of an often hostile new land, it should be in our hearts tonight, in all of our hearts. And all of the mothers of all of the babies who've been afflicted and affected by economic devastation and wonder what will happen in the coming days, weeks, and months should be in our hearts tonight. And all of the mothers of the children who are struggling to learn in school and have struggled even more as school has come to a too small dining room table in a too small house with too many children and not enough tools to teach and learn. They should be in our hearts tonight. And all of the mothers of over 150 women and men who have been slain on the streets of Columbus this year through homicides should be on our hearts tonight. And tonight, Adrian Hood and Tamala Payne and all the grieving mothers of sons who have died through shootings by law enforcement officers in our city should be in our hearts tonight. Simply put, all of the mothers of the world should be here tonight, should be in our hearts tonight, every single one of them. As I think of Mary, from cradle to cross, I am thinking of the mothers 
who are worrying tonight as they lay their children to sleep. I am thinking of all the mothers who have birthed and then buried their sons and daughters and always and forever experience that as too soon and too hard. On this Christmas Eve, I pray that we reflect on Mary, the first true prophet of our Christian faith, holding Jesus close to her heart, pondering everything beautiful and everything challenging, but everything good about her newborn boy. And as we come to God's Christmas table of grace, may we once again see him and may we see her and may we give thanks for Mary who has opened the door to each of our hearts.